Well, it's good to be the church today, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I, I, last night, I was not excited about it because I had no idea what I was going to say, and I had like, like two questions to work from. And then a third one came in through Facebook. Thank you, Adam. We're going to catch that one first. Um, and, um, and, and then this morning it started the gel, and I, it's gonna, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So Shelly is going to sit over here, and she's going to shoot questions at me kind of one at a time, and then I'm going to let her. She, she can interrupt me. You can't, okay? Um, and uh, if she, she, she thinks I'm going too long, she can gong me and uh, pull me off, okay? So how are we doing, Shell? Good, yeah, uh, good. The first one is from... <clears throat> the Orban family. I'm not sure it's just Adam, but oh, oh it, it's yeah, totally just yeah, him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can God make a taco so big that even he can't finish it? Okay, I have to tell you that this is the most deeply theological question that we will experience today. And, uh, of course, um, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that the reason Adam asked the question le- that he did, like he did is because, t- because today is National Taco Day. Did you? Really? It is today, o- October 4th. So get down to Fort Dodge, go to Taco Bell. I think they're giving away freebies, okay? And that would mean for your whole family. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's a great question, actually, because it is deeply theological. Here's the thing. Either way you answer that question, the answer is going to be too small. So if God can make a taco so big he can't eat it, then God is too small to eat it. Got that? And if he can eat the taco, he hasn't made a taco big enough and he can't do that. Either way, God is too small. And we believe with all of our hearts and it's, we're told in the Bible that God is, is, is universal, that he is, that he is wide and deep beyond imagination, that we can't even come to terms with that, which is also part of the answer, okay? Because, um, you know, God's so big, we can't wrap our heads around him. And this is a perfect example of that. In, in the Hindu uh, faith tradition, there, there's a saying, it's neti, neti. God is neither this or neither that, okay? Because if God is this, then he can't be that, 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 and that over there. So he's not that, and he's not that because then he can't be this, and he's not that up there because then he can't be these things. So neti, neti, God is neither this or that. And I think that's what's happening in the Christian Bible as well, all right? So, for instance, Moses asked God in Exodus chapter 3, what is your name? Well, the reason Moses wants God's name is so that he can take God, put him in the palm of his hand, and stick him in his back pocket. It's like God's his lucky rabbit foot, and he's in charge of God. God's small enough that he can contain him. All right? Does that make sense? The lesson that Shelley just read, why does he speak in parables? Well, He speaks in parables because it's kind of a riddle because it reveals things, but it also conceals things, and that's the nature of God. As soon as we think we know what God is and can kind of put a box around that, God is already too small because we can't do that. We can't wrap our heads around who he is. And so the Bible is not an answer book. The Bible is a riddle book. Because the biggest riddle of all is the God who creates everything and loves these little insects on this tiny little planet. Loves them so much that he dies for us. How can that be? So, if the Bible's a riddle, and I believe it is, I believe that with all my heart because we can't possibly understand who God is because he's too big. And as soon as we do think we understand it, All of a sudden, God's too small. So the answer to your question, Adam, is yes. God can make a taco large enough that he can't eat. And yes, he can eat it. All right. Next question. The next question. Another lighter one, and then we'll get to a deeper one. Well, I thought that was pretty deep. Well, it was. (laughs) Thank you. In its own way, yeah. (laughs) Does God control the weather? And that is by my granddaughter, Marie, right? 
It is. <laughs> I will just tell you, my granddaughter, my, my, we, we had pizza on, on Friday, and, and I told her I was doing this question and answer, and so she came up with this question, does God control the weather? Well, God made everything, right? And he, he didn't just make it. He made it by just simply saying, boom, there it is. Let there be light. Let there be, let there be the earth. Let there be this. Let there be that. Let there be life. Um, let there be clouds, let there be storms. And so, yeah, God is in charge of the weather. I believe that. I also believe that God uses the weather from time to time to send us messages. So, for instance, from the third hour, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness fell across the entire world. You all know where that came from, right? That came from the story of Jesus' death on Good Friday. And he's... He's hanging on the cross for three hours from noon, the sixth hour, to three o'clock, the ninth hour. And darkness came upon the earth, right? And then in Matthew's gospel, after that, it says that when Jesus breathed his last, there was an earthquake, okay? Natural kind of phenomena, right? Now, do I think that happens all the time? Um, I don't know. I I don't think so. I don't think he like, uh, I don't think he zaps us because we're out of line. Uh, The Bible does say that the weather is an indicator of the end times. It does say that. And, and, but except the problem with that is, so you might say, okay, so if weather's an a, 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 a indicator of the end times, we're in 2020, this has been the, the most horrible year that we could ever imagine. The weather has been uncooperative. We have, we have hurricanes that have gone to the second time around in terms of the alphabet. We have this going on. We have that going on. We have the fires out west. It's, uh, the world is just a mess. And so God is coming, right? Not necessarily. Because if you think back in history and just, just do a little searching about weather patterns, you will find that these kinds of stuff happen time and time and time and time again. You can go back as far as Jesus himself, and you will find every so often that it looks like the end is coming and the weather is an indicator. So what I like to think about when I think about these things is I like to think about something from the book of Acts chapter 1, where where the disciples say, how can we know when you're coming again? And Jesus says to them, that's not your business. It's not for you to know the time or the season or when or how. Just keep focused on the job that I have for you. Tell others about me. Be my witness is what he says. But basically that's what it means. Tell others about me and tell them all around the world. And trust me and hope in me. So don't worry about what's coming down the pike. And I know a lot of people do that. By the way, um, I've, I'm planning this next year to do a, a long sermon series on the book of Revelation. I think that's what I'm going to do. A- and I think I, I'm excited about that because I think when people hear that word, the book of Revelation, they start getting, they start getting anxious and afraid because they think it's end times and it's, you know, it's, it's fire and it's hell and there's going to be this big catastrophe. And yeah, some of those things are in the book of Revelation. But for me, I will tell you, that I've, I've been studying the book of Revelations for a long time, and it is some of the most hopeful literature in all of Scripture, hope-filled literature. I mean, when I die, you guys are going to be reading large portions of it over my casket because I've lived by those things. It is a message of unbridled hope. And when we talk about the end times, when we talk about what's coming, Don't look at the clouds. Look at the promise of Jesus Christ and his love for us. And those little messages he's tossed in the ocean in a bottle and sent back to us that say, you know, whatever's in here, it's going to be like a million times better when you get there. So I hope that answers your question, Marie. Probably a little more than you wanted, but yes, he is in charge of the weather because he is God, right? All right, next one. All right, the next one. God is in charge. Oh, here we what go What does that mean to you? Okay, what does that mean to me? Okay, and I think that was Keith, if I'm not mistaken. Um, excuse me. <coughs> it's not COVID, it's just fall. 
Um, so God's in charge, and what does that mean to me? When I think about God being in charge, how are we doing here? Is this at all interesting? But I like putting you guys to sleep. Okay, well, I try not to. So. Um, yeah. so God's in charge. What that means to me is I, when I think about what God's in charge of, I think about, I think about my life, my purpose in life. I think about um, the, 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 the lives of the people around me and their purpose in life and where they're called to be and what they're called to do. I think about the congregation I serve and especially this congregation. I think it's an exciting time. I think, that there is, I think that there is purpose and direction for us. And I think um, God's in charge. What does it mean to me? Is that right, Shelley? Okay. And when I think of that, I think about, you know, God has plans for us. He's in charge. Now, for me, what that means is I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and cross my legs and do this and... Um, and say, well, let me know when, God. That's not going to happen because nothing will happen. It's just, you're just going to sit there and do nothing. There's a, there was a great little comic I found years ago. It's a, guy, it's a guy sitting beside the telephone looking at the telephone, and he says, Harvey is in need of a new vacuum cleaner, but he only buys from telephone salesmen. So he's sitting there looking and waiting and waiting for the phone call that will come from the, from the vacuum clean salesman who... He knows someday we'll call him, and he will, his carpet is going to be like this with dirt by the time it actually happens. And I think we get stuck in that a lot. I really do. So what we do is we make the plans. We do our best at looking out and setting points on the horizon. We're calling them visions, and we're going to be talking about visions in a big way next year. We have a committee that is working on where the church is going in the next 10 years. And uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we're starting to wrap all that up. So we're making plans. We're thinking about what's it going to look like 10 years from now. Who's going to be your pastor? Uh, how are you going to choose that person? Uh, what kind of ministry do we need to be looking at? How do we continue to invite young people? And I will tell you that that is happening big time. Come on a Wednesday night. Most of you who have been here for a lot of years, you won't recognize three-fourths of them. It's just cool. Okay? But so we make the plans. We set the points on the horizon, but God is in charge of the results. And you know, it doesn't matter that that point that we've set on the horizon is where we actually end up. We just go. And God's in charge of the results. And he might do this, and he might go, shh, shoom, pump, pump, somewhere along the line, and he's going to do this, and he's going to say, you know, that was a good idea, but you need to head this, this way. All right? Case in point, and I'm, I'm not trying to tell you how great I am because I'm not. Uh, when I was in St. Olaf in Fort, Fort Dodge, uh, we had this vision of putting together a youth coffee house in Fort Dodge for troubled kids. And we took it on as a congregation. And we, we studied it for six months. And at the end of six months, we said, we, we, all, we all agreed, this is not feasible. We can't do this. Okay, so we had that point in the horizon. We went out there, and we got to a point, and, and the, uh, the, the, the realists in the crowd, because I'm not that, if any of you know me, you know that, the realists said, hey, look at the numbers, look at, look at the, the kind of energy it's going to take, look at the kind of volunteers it's going to take. We can't do it. Foomp. And then God went like this. He went, Shoomp. and he put in front of me three of my colleagues pastors and other faith communities in Fort Dodge. And we started having coffee together. And pretty soon, it wasn't St. Olaf's project. It was a citywide project with five churches involved. That was, oh, my goodness, let me think. That was seven or eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. It's still going. They still, they still have my phone number on their Facebook page, and I still get calls from kids wondering if Icky's is open. Um, and and it's, it's exciting because we set the point on the horizon. We, head, we, we started heading in that direction. We set the plans. God was in charge of the results. And that's the way we need to live as a congregation, and frankly, that's the way you need to live as individuals. Because far too often in our personal lives and in our public lives, we get stuck. We're Harvey waiting for the phone call and the vacuum salesman to call. 
Well, get up and go get a vacuum. Go out to the store and head in that direction and get the vacuum and get your crazy carpet cleaned, right? And so while you're heading out there, you're listening to the radio, and the radio says there are vacuum sales at Target rather than Marshall's. And so, boom, you take and move, and you turn. And I know that's kind of a silly example, but the same is true in your life. Maybe your vision in life is to retire with a gazillion dollars. Head in that direction. Somewhere along the line, God, I can promise you, somewhere along the line, God is going to take that and move it in a different way. And it might be that you've gotten the gazillion dollars or very close, but you've gotten to retirement and you've realized that chasing the little white ball isn't enough to give your life meaning. And that's God talking to you. And all of a sudden, you find yourself knee-deep with your fi- some of your finances into a project that gives your life meaning be- beyond what you ever believed before. You always thought toes in the sand in Florida and golf endlessly was the end-all, be-all, and you get there and you realize, no, God had a different plan. That was the original plan, but this is, the, this is God's plan for me, and you're going you're gonna to take a turn because you know, it's the, it, you, you know it's the only way for you. So, Keith, when I say God's in charge, that's what I mean. That's what I think of, and I think about that for all of our lives. I told Pastor before that I kind of feel like the moderator at the debate, <laughs> kind of, kind of do. Yeah. It looks like we have. Well, you're doing you're doing better than Chris Wallace did. Okay. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, looks like we have we have a lot more questions, but um, I think one more, depending on how long you go. How long have we gone? Um, 16, 17 minutes. Oh, time flies when we're having fun, doesn't it? Um, yeah. This one kind of hits close to home for me over the last few years. So it says, why is death so scary? If God only gives you as much as you can handle, how does God know when you've had too much to handle? Wow. Do you all hear that? What a fabulous question. How, do you, how does God know when you have too much to handle? And why is death so scary? And why is death so scary? Well, that one's easy because you can't see on the other side. And from this side, it looks like the end. You breathe your last, and immediately your body starts decaying, and you're gone. And that's what we see, right? That's scary. It's like there's this, there's this wall there. Or, no, better yet, it's like, it's like driving in, like this morning, driving in Iowa ground fog. Okay? So we, go down, we went down the hill into St. Joe, and it's clear all around, and all of a sudden, boom, we're hemmed in, and you can't see. And that's, it's, it's a little unnerving, because you don't know for sure if a semi is going around somebody at that precise second. You can't tell because you can't see it. And death is a lot like that. It's like a veil that you can't see beyond. Okay? That's what I think of when I think of death. And that's why it's, that's why it's scary for all of us. It's scary for me. And, um, and that should come as no surprise. I'm just as messed up and as human as everybody else. So, um, oh, the, the other part of the question is enough. When does God, read it again, please. If God only gives you as much as you can handle, how does God know when you've had too okay, much? good, good. Um, I think that the premise of the question is false. I think, first of all, God doesn't give us bad stuff. I think we, I, I think we always, always, always in this life get more than we can handle. You got that? Listen to this carefully. This is important, folks. If you can handle it, you don't need him, right? And if you can handle it, you're only fooling yourself because you can't. We can live with that illusion for a long time, but someday, someday everyone, mark my words, someday everyone is going to go down that hill to St. Joe and see the wall. 
And it might be death, but it might be something else. And it's big and it's scary and you don't know what's inside that wall. Might be death, might be something else. And you can't handle it because you can't see it and you can't control it. It's out of your control. That's important. Because at that point, you have a choice. You can either go crazy trying to figure it out yourself or you can lean on the everlasting arms of the Savior. I choose the latter. In the next few weeks, I have a a very special sermon series prepared. I am so excited about this. I have been interviewing people who sit or have sat in my pews, and they're going to tell their life stories. Okay, so we've done the interview. I've got three of the interviews done. I've got two more to do tomorrow, and I've videoed them, and they're going to be up on the screen for like eight to ten minutes, and they're going to talk about they're going to talk about their their particular struggles in life. And they're doing it because they want to share their story because they know you guys have similar stories out there, okay? So, and Connie, I'm going to pick on you. Connie and I, sorry. (laughs) Connie and I sat down on Thursday. And because, as you you all know, Connie has struggled with cancer. And not just struggle and done, but it's been since 1990. And it's, it's hung as a pall over her. And so she tells that story, and I will tell you that there were tears from both of us by the end of that. And there will be tears for you as well because you've lived it as well. And the one thing that I keep getting out of all of these stories is that when you hit the, when you hit the veil, to a person, all, all of them so far, when you hit the veil, it's not enough to try to do it on your own. You have to have God and you have to be able to lean into his almighty presence, his never-ending love and the power and promise of his hope that will see you through no matter what it is you face. So I've got Connie talking about her situation. I have um, uh, Dawn some of you don't know Dawn. She comes to uh, church on Wednesday night. She has three kids. She lost it. She lost a child. Um, uh, it was a special needs child at 15 months, and that was a long time ago. And she still lives with it. She's going to talk about that. Some of you know these things. I have Roger, who's from my former parish. Yesterday, I saw on Facebook. I just lined this up yesterday. I saw on Facebook that it was the seven-year anniversary of his father's suicide, and I'd forgotten that because I did the funeral. And so I called Roger, and he, he was putting up suicide prevention stuff on Facebook. I called Roger and said, hey, you know, if, you, if you're open to it, it's, I know it's going to be hard. He, said, he, he, didn't even, he didn't even bat an eye. Yeah, let's do it. It's going to be a very special sermon series, I think. And, and I, my hope is, as, as I know the hope is for every person who has done this, is that it will touch you and it will speak to you because you've been through some of these things yourself. You know, when you've been given too much, when you know that, when you find yourself leaning on God. You want to do another one? Am I like boring you guys to tears? He had told me before, jump in if you want. And I said, no, I really don't want to. But this one, yeah. if, I, if I could just add... Um, I should have asked you that because it's something you've just been through yourself. Three times recently. And what I can tell you is that death is scary, like Pastor said, because you don't know what's on the other side. But as believers, we have an idea what that is. And it's not actually dying, or it's not what comes after that you're scared about. It's the actual process of dying and that's what's so scary because you don't know what's going gonna actually happen but in my experience of going through this numerous times 
is that God gives everyone surrounding you that grace, that when it is your time, you're not scared anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's God doing that. And so while it's hard to go through and see that, it really gives me peace knowing that when it's my time, that death can be a really beautiful thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Shelley. Um, I've, uh, I've been working with hospice for a lot of years, and right now I'm the volunteer chaplain over there. Um, and, and I know folks are, from time to time will say, man, that's got to be depressing. And it's not. It's, um, it's the most, one of the most life-giving things I do because, I mean, families, they bury hatchets. They come to terms with each other. They say things to each other that they haven't said in years. And those things have been hanging between them like horrible clouds. And they gather around someone that they love who's ending their life. And we sing songs. And we hold hands. And we whisper, I love you. And when they pass, it is the most curiously sacred experiences that I've ever been a part of. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I hope that for all of you, when it comes time that you are laying in that bed, that it will become that kind of, that kind of transition. And that your legacy in your final moments will be a legacy of life through the grace of Jesus Christ. Shall do you have anything to add to that? Of other questions, maybe we save them. And maybe do we should again. do this again sometime. Do you guys like? Is this okay? Okay, let's let's do this again. Um, bow your heads with me, please, and sing. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus.